I want to briefly just look at the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. These are much more straightforward muscles. We assume they're less complex. And remember, they are the extrinsics that are flexing, and they are only secondary at the MP joint. Primary MP joint is an extrinsic extensor, but the flexors are intrinsics. Here we're looking at excursion, which is also muscle fiber length. And we see that the dorsal and volar interossei, these first two columns, are very small, almost insignificant, compared to the significant length of the profundus and the superficialis here in the back. And look how close the lumbrical is. Now this may seem confusing because the flexor digitorum profundus, which is the dark green, crosses one joint more than the superficialis. And yet this graph says that the superficialis has greater excursion. Well, how can that be? Well, it can be because of the anatomy, because a portion of the flexor digitorum superficialis originates far more proximally than the profundus, making this actually a longer muscle tendon unit than the profundus, even though the profundus crosses one additional joint. Both the FDS and FDP are very strong extrinsic muscles, as we know. The power for both of these muscles is maximized by wrist extension, by the pres presence of the flexor retinaculum that does not allow these tendons to bowstring, as well as the pulleys within the flexor sheath that keeps the flexor tendons very close to the bone of the finger to maximize its potential power. Here is a wonderful illustration from Dr. Bogomil of the flexor retinaculum. Thick, wide, and very strong, retaining all of the flexor tendons. Here is a cross-section of the flexor sheath. Here's the distal ulna and radius and we see that the profundus are deeper and the superficialis sit more superficially. Unlike the textbooks where the tendons uh, are supposed to sit in perfect order one above the other, if you were to be able to look at these tendons in cross-section during movement, you would see that they actually move and they actually flip around each other and they, they change their orientation. There's a significant amount of movement of the flexor tendons within the carpal tunnel in relationship to one another. The flexor pollicis longus is also present but is over here pretending it's not part of the ball game. The single most important factor for normal function of the flexor tendons is the ability to extend the wrist during finger flexion and sustain with some power that position of wrist extension. Well, think about it. If the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis contract, they're powerful, and you're not able to stabilize a wrist, you cannot transfer that flexor power to the fingers to flex them. You have to have that power for wrist stabilization. The flexor pulleys within the digital sheath are an extraordinary example of human anatomy. The annular pulleys and the cruciate or cross pulleys are built in such a way that during end range finger flexion, they actually meet together to retain the flexor tendon against the bones. The cruciform pulleys appear closer to the joints to allow this compression to occur while still providing very strong fibers to maintain the flexor tendons in position. With full finger flexion, with the fingertip touching the palm, all of these come together. With absence of pulleys, this full finger flexion is not possible. This is the mechanical magic of the flexor tendons. The amount of contact between the flexor digitorum profundus 
and, excuse me, this is the superficialis I'm pointing to. Here's the profundus. The profundus is moving distally. This is the DIP joint and the insertion. It's coming through the superficialis, which has split. The superficialis comes back together, and it has a very long insertion. These are the vincula providing nutrition to the flexor tendon. One of the reasons we have such difficulty with excursion of the flexor tendons is the amount of contact between the profundus and the superficialis in this area. They must glide differentially because they're different lengths, but following trauma, it's difficult to maintain this independent excursion. Differential glide is required whenever there's full interphalangeal joint flexion and the differential glide within zone 2 has nothing to do with the position of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Because of this differential glide being a result of interphalangeal joint flexion, if the MP joint is brought into extension, that will bring into the maximum differential glide. So, maximum differential glide of the flex between the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis occurs in the active hook position. What about the profundus specifically? It seems very easy, yes. It's primary for both DIP and PIP joint flexion. It can flex the MP joint primarily, but usually it does not. It only does that if all other forces are absent. Normally, it's a very secondary MP joint flexor. It is the dominant flexor of the finger. As we'll see, the superficialis is more erratic and does, always, does not always strongly participate in active finger flexion. Langemuir told us that the effect of contraction of the flexor digitorum profundus is to a large extent determined by the arrangement of the tendinous elements in the dorsal apparatus. In other words, that dorsal apparatus has to move as we've described to allow the flexor to fully flex the finger. The index finger tends to be somewhat more independent both anatomically and cortically. The long ring and little fingers have a common muscle belly and are in interdependent in addition to which they have lumbricals that are shared thus really demanding that the three fingers always work in unison. Here we see the lumbricals originating from the little ring and long finger and you can see that that interconnects these three tendons whereas the index finger is more, inter is more independent. The superficialis is primary for PIP flexion. Since it does not continue to the DIP joint, it can have no effect there. And it is secondary for the MP joint. But the FDS, or superficialis, is often not recruited during finger flexion. If there's powerful flexion, the superficialis participates. And interestingly, if the wrist is flexed, the superficialis is going to participate more. But it is not always there, so we cannot consider it to be the primary. It's rather erratic in its participation during finger flexion, and some people don't recruit it at all. We do recruit it whenever we exclude the DIP joint from flexion and we isolate it. But Concurrent FDP and FDS participation is rare in some individuals. This is an area I believe that merits more, greater study uh, for us to appreciate in greater depth exactly when and how the superficialis does contribute. We know that the superficialis has a long insertion. Here we see the superficialis and its insertion, the profundus has been pulled out, leaving the tunnel through which it normally resides. 